Welcome, dear listeners, to another episode of The Inebriated Past with Matt Crispin. I'm your host, Matt Crispin. Less inebriated than usual, uh, but more excited than ever to dig into the past, to talk about the things that resonate and echo, and as George Lucas said, rhyme, uh, throughout the rippling uh, waves of time. Uh, And I know a lot of us uh, are still reeling from the shocking end of a campaign that we all really uh, had a lot of uh, personal, emotional, and psychological investment in, and we're all reeling and trying to figure out what to do next and what we did wrong, and I thought with that on everyone's mind, it might be useful to look back on a campaign that in many ways resonates historically with a lot of the same structural issues that are happening uh, now. And you might be thinking, well, what about, this must be about Eugene V. Debs. After all, Eugene Debs was the most prominent American socialist politician before Bernie Sanders and Bernie Sanders' personal hero. He made a documentary about Eugene Debs in the 70s. He has a picture of him in his office in the Senate. He's clearly his lodestar. And while Debs made some impressive presidential runs in the early 20th century he gained over a million votes uh in one contest he at the end of the day was a different sort of uh political figure than sanders in that he was an independent leftist trying to push change through the political system through the vehicle of a third party asserting pressure on the two-party system and the more i thought about it the less that seemed to be similar to what bernie sanders was doing I think a closer analog analog happens a few years after Eugene Debs is no longer uh, a political figure with Amer- with influence in America, but who is definitely who what, that was definitely run uh, in the spirit of Debs uh, and as a continuation of Debs's project. Uh, I speak, of course, of the 1934 campaign for California governor of socialist muckraker, playwright, vegetarian, uh, utopian socialist, teetotaler, uh, an absolute uh, attempted renaissance man, Upton Sinclair. And uh, just as a note, uh, I will be depending for a lot of the the color uh, in this account with a great book from the early 90s called Campaign of the Century by Greg Mitchell, which is a literal day-by-day chronicling of the last month uh, and a half between the September primary and the November general election, two months uh, that the main campaign was fought. And it's a very interesting book, and uh, if anyone wants more details about this uh, historical incident, that book's a good source to, to begin with. But I still think, for a lot of reasons, we should start with Debs. We really should, because he is the person who uh, represented the stage in socialist development of socialism in America when socialism had achieved a political form. It had sort of grown out of being a, 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 an ideology or an individual or, or group practice outside of uh, the legitimating systems of government, but an actual part of uh, the political mechanism seeking power within a state, an actual attempt to legislate redistribution of power and resources uh, using the ballot box, which was going to inevitably occur in America given its uh, enduring democratic institutions. So we start with Debs, but not on the stump uh, in a courthouse, specifically a courthouse a federal courthouse in 1918 where he stood convicted of the crime of violating the Sedition Act, a wartime measure passed by uh, Woodrow Wilson, still in force and uh, recently used by the Obama administration to go after whistleblowers. Uh, It was an attempt to squelch the massive amount of opposition to America entering World War I through uh, authoritarian political means making it illegal to tell people, don't 
fight in the war. Debs' conviction was uh, upheld by the Supreme Court in a famous decision, the decision where everyone's favorite liberal jurist, Oliver Wendell Holmes, defined the limit of freedom as sh- the freedom to shout fire, fire in a crowded theater, even though the case in front of him was about someone who told people not to go in to a, a burning theater, a.k.a. Europe in 1917. But anyway, our protagonist, Eugene Debs, stands accused, convicted, and about to be sentenced. Uh, and he gave an address to the court that I still think is one of the most moving speeches uh, in American political history, and I just don't want to miss the opportunity to, to, to read it right now in its entirety. Your Honor, years ago I recognized my kinship with all living beings, and I made up my mind that I was not one bit better than the meanest on earth. I said then and I say now that while there is a lower class, I am in it, and while there is a criminal element, I am of it, and while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. I listened to all that was said in this court in support and justification of this prosecution, but my mind remained unchanged. I look upon the espionage law as a despotic enactment in flagrant conflict with democratic principles and with the spirit of free institutions. Your Honor, I have stated in this court that I am opposed to the social system in which we live, that I believe in a fundamental change, but if possible, by peaceful and orderly means. Standing here this morning, I recall my boyhood. At 14, I went to work in a railroad shop. At 16, I was firing a freight engine on a railroad. I remember all the hardships and privations of that early day, and from that time until now, my heart has been with the working class. I could have been in Congress long ago. I have preferred to go to prison. I am thinking this morning of the men in the mills and the factories, of the men in the mines and on the railroads. I am thinking of the women who, for a poultry wage, are compelled to work out their barren lives, of the little children who in this system are robbed of their childhood and in their tender years are seized in the remorseless grasp of mammon and forced into the industrial dungeons, there to feed the monster machine while they themselves are being starved and stunted, body and soul. I see them dwarfed and diseased and their little lives broken and blasted because in this high noon of Christian civilization, money is still so much more important than the flesh and blood of childhood. In very truth, gold is God today and the rules with pitiless sway in the affairs of men. In this country, the most favored beneath the bending skies, we have vast areas of the richest and most fertile soil, material resources in inexhaustible abundance, the most marvelous productive machinery on earth, and millions of eager workers ready to apply their labor to that machinery to produce in abundance for every man, woman, and child. And if there are still vast numbers of our people who are the victims of poverty and whose lives are an unceasing struggle all the way from youth to old age until at last death comes to their rescue and lulls these hapless victims to dreamless sleep, it is not the fault of the Almighty. It cannot be charged to nature, but it is due entirely to the outgrown social system in which we live that ought to be abolished, not only in the interest of the toiling masses, but in the higher interest of all humanity. I believe, Your Honor, in common with all socialists, that this nation ought to own and control its own industries. I believe, as all socialists do, that all things that are jointly needed and used ought to be jointly owned. That industry, the basis of our social life, instead of being the private property of a few and operated for their enrichment, ought to be the common property of all, democratically administered in the interests of all. I am opposing a social order in which it is possible for one man who does absolutely nothing that is useful to amass a fortune of hundreds of millions of dollars, while millions of men and women who work all the days of their lives secure barely enough for a wretched existence. This order of things cannot always endure. I have registered my protest against it. I recognize the feebleness of my effort, but unfortunately, I am not alone. There are multiple thousands of others who, like myself, have come to realize that before we all truly enjoy the blessings of civilized life, we must reorganize society upon a mutually and cooperative basis, and that to this end we have organized a great economic and political movement that spreads over the face of all the earth. There are today upwards of 60 million socialists, loyal, devoted adherents to this cause, regardless of nationality, race, creed, color, or sex, They are all making common cause. They are spreading with tireless energy the propaganda of the new social order. They are waiting, watching, and working, hopefully through all the hours of the day and the night. They are still in a minority, but they have learned how to be patient and to bide their time. They feel, they know indeed, that the time is coming. In spite of all opposition, all persecution, when this emancipating gospel will spread among all the peoples, 
And when this minority will become the triumphant majority and sweeping into power, inaugurate the greatest social and economic change in history. In that day, we shall have the universal commonwealth, the harmonious cooperation of every nation with every other nation on earth. Your Honor, I ask no mercy and I plead for no immunity. I realize that finally the right must prevail. I never so clearly comprehended as now the great struggle between the powers of greed and exploitation on the one hand and upon the other the rising hosts of industrial freedom and social justice. I can see the dawn of the better day for humanity. The people are awakening. In due time they will and must come to their own. When the mariner sailing over tropic seas looks for relief from their wary watch, he turns his eyes toward the Southern Cross, burning luridly above the tempest-vexed ocean. As the midnight approaches, the Southern Cross begins to bend. The whirling worlds change their places, and with starry finger points, the Almighty marks the passage of time upon the dial of the universe, and though no bell may beat the glad tidings, the lookout knows that the midnight is passing and that relief and rest are close at hand. Let the people everywhere take heart of hope. For the cross is bending, the midnight is passing, and joy cometh in the morning. So, yeah, he went to jail. No. Uh, but from his federal prison, he ran for president in 1920 uh, and got nearly a million votes. Running a campaign, that slogan of which was, Vote Prisoner Number 9653. But... Uh, well, Debs never came terribly close to uh, winning higher office. Socialists at the lower le level who were oriented towards Debs did make a lot of successes in, the, er, um, in races from town council to mayor, sheriffs, uh, even a couple of members of Congress in uh, socialist German-heavy Milwaukee. And, and uh, for a while there, the, the socialists looked like they were going to be making their play to be a permanent fixture of the American political infrastructure uh, and in fact eventually supplant the Democratic Party uh, or the Republicans because it was still kind of fluid at that point uh, but then the Red Scare hit. Then after the Russian Revolution, socialism became uh, uh, both more of a threat in real terms and also easier to vilify in the press and we had our first Red Scare uh, that's the one where Big Bill Haywood and Emma Goldman got deported and Palmer raids and all that stuff. And the the Socialist Party itself was never really recovered from it. Uh, and especially considering that a lot, a large number of socialists split off to join the new Communist Party uh, to align with Moscow uh, against the uh, the bourgeois West. So one of those people, though, who ran for higher office under the banner of socialism inspired by Eugene Debs was one Upton Buell Sinclair Jr. Uh, who is from Mayflower stock, a wasp's wasp, uh, who came from a very well-off Southern aristocratic family that fell on hard times after the Civil War. He was born in Baltimore to the son of a homemaker and a, uh, and a itinerant alcoholic salesman who left the family very early he grew up uh, in poverty uh, in new york city he claims in fact that once he came upon his father derelict in an alley while walking through uh, manhattan uh, and it helped push him towards forming the identity that he got over time which is that he was basically a fully uh, embodied version of the type of the New England Mayf uh, New England Puritan do-gooder. There are, are a number of threads that make up American leftist tradition, and one of the most foundational ones is the tradition of flinty New England uh, busybodies, basically, who went from being witch-burning Puritans to wave much more... Uh, I, uh, uh, much more theologically loose uh, congregationalists who then took their reduction in uh, spiritual obsession and turned it into reforming society along civilized lines. Now that they weren't burning witches, they could m mellow out and, and get people to stop drinking so much they beat their wives to death, that kind of stuff. Um, 
He was personally very prudish in addition to being a teetotaler. Uh, he was a vegetarian. He was also, uh, he basically believed in everything. Uh, he was very much more a Marianne than a Bernie. But the thing to remember is that both Marianne and Bernie are expressions of, of alienation under capitalism, spiritual and material. Uh, and your personal approach to those injustices and alienations is sort of based around your existing character traits. And uh, for a number of reasons, Upton gravitated toward the spiritual conception of socialism. So he was very much in favor of uh, basically approaching politics through the lens of morality. He, 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 he saw that which was wrong and decided to make it right by drawing people's attention to it. Direct address. Um, his most famous book, of course, is The Jungle about exploited stock workers in uh, st stockyard workers in Chicago, uh, which only led America to get freaked out about how many fingers were in their, uh, their canned potted beef, which led to the Pure Food and Drug Act being passed. And famously, Sinclair said that he shot for America's hearts and he hit him in the stomach. Because when you read the book, those Lithuanian immigrants getting ground in a burger uh, are less real to your life than the burger you might eat that might have them in it. Especially at a time when, you know, exploitation and, and brutality were sort of the norm. Uh, but Sinclair refused to hew to the times. He demanded things be better. Uh, and that led him to be very open-minded and sometimes to the point of credulity. Um, he wrote all these crusading books on all these subjects uh, condemning wealth, greed, immorality, basically, and their expression in the material world. And, uh, and, Hank, and, and basically calling on Americans to, to rise to the, the, call of the, the song of the better, better angels of their nature. Uh, but he also believed in some pretty out there stuff. Uh, he, was a, he, was, he, he was a believer in mental telepathy and, in fact, wrote a book with his wife called, uh, he wrote a book with his wife called Mental Radio, claiming to uh, document his experiments with trying to perceive extrasensorily. Uh, and he was also a big early advocate of uh, chiropractic. Uh, oh, I forgot. At one point, he tried to form a cooperative commune in New Jersey that lasted for several years before breaking up uh, in acrimonious disunion. He believed in many, many things, and one of the things he foolishly believed in was the United States of America, which is why he often also, in addition to writing uh, compulsively uh, about America's deprivations, he also felt moved to act to stop them, so he ran for office frequently. He ran on a prohibition ticket once, and he ran a couple of times for governors for governor of different places as he moved around uh, in, uh, as a socialist candidate, and he was, in fact a socialist candidate for governor uh, in 1928. Uh, and he ran for office a lot. And when the Great Depression came, he felt a calling that he needed to do something. Uh, and in 1930, he ran for governor of California, which at that point he uh, lived in with his uh, second wife, uh, Craig Sinclair. He ran for governor uh, under the socialist ticket. Uh, he was a card-carrying socialist at that point his entire adult life. Uh, he got... 3.6% of the vote, a little over 50,000 votes. So that's how he did in a race where uh, the Republican Sonny Jim Rolfe won with a million votes. So he did okay, but it wasn't blowing anybody's skirt up, as they used to say in the 30s. So uh, Sinclair had been a socialist his whole adult life. He broke with the party in 1917 for condemning the war effort, which he supported, uh, he bung he bungled that one for sure, but he was back in the party in 1920, and it was he was with it for the whole. He was a card carrying member of the whole 20s, and as I said, he ran for governor in 1930 as a socialist. But the election of FDR in 1932 really galvanized something in uh, Sinclair. Uh, he had, like many socialists, written off uh, the Democratic Party entirely as just a giant patronage machine that. Uh, it was it was just a back slapping cycle between Ku Klux Klan, Southern uh, Latifundists, and Northern Tammany Hall uh, white ethnic ward healers. No ideology to speak of. Uh, uh, all, all, Wilson's progressivism was just a shadow of the progressivisms of the other parties. 
Uh, I've spoke, I talked a bit before about how back in, at this point, the political parties weren't really polarized along ideological lines. And uh, it's actually kind of interesting in that respect because sometimes the question, people under the question, why is the Democratic Party like the party of social liberalism and economic liberalism or ideal, like theoretically? Why are they the ones for economic justice and, and, and inclusive ideas of who should have rights in a society, in a public setting? And, you know, it was a slow process of realignment, obviously. I mean, for real dullards like Denise D'Souza, they say, ah, no, it's the same party. But it is still a question that needs to be answered. And part of the reason, one of the most important proximate causes of the fact that the Democratic Party is now the party of, I mean, for the last 40 years, less and less economic justice and social justice to make more and more as social justice as it is less and less a party of economic justice, but it's party broadly construed of justice as understood by people on the left hand of the spectrum. And a lot of it coils down to the total act, the, the, the relative accident that Republicans were in power when the great depression started, because that meant that they were responsible directly to capital. Uh, in, in their response, and capital wanted one thing, austerity, so that it could suck the marrow out of the bones uh, and, and commence the death drive, because there is no self-regulating mechanism in capitalism to make it stop sucking if the, if the body is dying. It is very much like a virus in that respect. It will drive it to death it doesn't, unless it's regulated by some social intervention in the form of capitalism being transformed from its extractive form to a cooperative uh, economic model. So that means that the party in power, when a crisis like that happens, they're going to, whatever bid they give in terms of redistribution to prevent human misery is going to be a low bid because it's made behalf directly on capital. The party out of power is in a unique position to be able to position themselves and bid publicly to the economic left without consequence because they aren't in power yet. Their incentives are different than the incentives of an incumbent uh, government regime that's supposed to represent capital. And so that means when the Democrats take power, they actually have a mandate to do something to the left and, 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 and public leverage to push it forward, which makes it a real thing and defines now uh, the Democrats to the left. And the Democrats became saturated with meaning around the concept of economic uh, equality but then over time, as the economic boon of post-World War II era fell away uh, and austerity started being introduced by the logic of capitalism, they, dr they were drained of that uh, 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 quality of, of uh, economic populism. Uh, but they made up for it because now with, with the social conditions changing uh, and there being a more equitable distribution of resources, there's less economic, less direct economic uh, material want in the country that creates is changing social values that favor social liberalism so that's where the social civil rights movement comes and so at that point with the democrats in power with a mandate to do social reform that is not a challenge to capitalism they enrich their notion as themselves the, their notion to themselves and others as a party of justice along the social line uh to the to the uh, same intensity that they had to the economic now of course the machine broke, uh, food machine broke in the 70s, and that relationship, of that dynamic was destroyed. So now it's just burgeoning, burgeoning, burgeoning uh, uh, emotional connection to social progressivism to make up for the absolute lack of economic uh, populism. But what this means for Upton Sinclair is that in 1932, now these two parties, which it seems sort of amorphous ideologically, they were both parties of capital. One tended to do better in the North and the other in the South, thanks to the legacy of the Civil War. Um, and they both had progressives. They both had people who were, were closer to the socialist vision of, a, of or at least wanted a mixed economy. And they were almost in equal measure in both parties. They, uh, all of the presidents until 1920 were progressives in name and deed, from uh, FDR to Taft to, uh, to, from TR to Taft to Wilson. To varying noticeable degrees so that like quantum state the parties were in got settled by the huge 
material intervention of the Great Depression and the fact that the Republicans were in charge. So that means the Democrats came out of it with a real association with the concept of economic justice. And Upton Sinclair took note. So he started thinking bigger in terms of what he could do politically because now he wasn't feeling like he was wedded to a long deray, uh, like long march uh, through the political system with the socialists, with maybe the end result that they'll supplant the liberal party like the labor did in the UK. No, you could maybe go right for the top or at least advance the ball much further down the field. So between 1930 and 1934, Upton Sinclair started uh, the EPIC movement. EPIC stood for End Poverty in California. And it was introduced by a book that Sinclair put out in 1933. It, it was called I, Governor, and How I Ended Poverty. And of course, because he was a novelist and a storyteller first, it's sort of a dream of his, a vision of his uh, gubernatorial uh, run. And it shows him winning, instituting his epic plan, and then riding off like Cincinnati uh, back to his little house in Pasadena having ended poverty in California, which is what Epic stood for, again. And most of the book is made up of what the Epic plan is. And the basic idea behind the Epic plan was to recognize the crisis of capitalism at the moment was of demand and managing flows of materials. Because you had people starving and you had farmers overproducing food they couldn't sell. That is a manageable problem, but not in the market in a situation where there's a huge crisis uh within the mechanism of at at the level of money so the 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 new deal which fdr got elected handily in 1932 on and was still experimenting with uh by the time uh in those first two years uh it's important to remember that the new deal was not like the contract for america it was not a 10 commandments list of options that or of policies it was essentially a relatively vague promise that when FDR got in there, they were going to try some stuff because Hoover wasn't trying anything and it wasn't working. Uh, and people were willing to do, with no other option than the status quo that sucked, they were willing to go along with it. So, the, but, so they were giving him some patience, but it was still a very piecework, um, uh, uh, hodgepodge approach. They would try something. If they got too much pushback from either capital or the public, they'd, break, break, they'd uh, ball down or some combination of that, and then they would try something else. But it was working to the degree that even though power, uh, unemployment was going down in general trend, but not in a stable direction, there were still big spikes of poverty month to month, and there was still over 10% unemployment, well, the, 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 the people were working on it. And the, so people were still willing to give FDR the benefit of the doubt. But the basic idea of the, of the New Deal mechanisms is we were going to prime the pump, like Kane said. We're going to put more money into the system, and then it will make its way into the hands of people. Sinclair's answer, Epic, is, is, is basically meeting that bid and raising it in the direction of leftism, in the direction of an idea of what socialism could be in America. Epic called for the confiscation of lands uh, in California that were owed, uh, that owed property taxes, which was huge, huge swaths of the most fertile California land because people couldn't afford to pay. It wasn't so that they could evict the farmers, though. Um, Sinclair's idea was that the monetary system would in some significant percentage in California be replaced by a what he called production for use, a system where unemployed people would be put to work in, uh, in idle factories and on fallow farmland. They would pay their equivalent tax uh, in kind, and then they would essentially be given chits to, to trade those industrially manufactured goods for the work of the farm land. This is actually kind of uh, what the informal economy uh, in Russia was during uh, under war communism. Uh, people would like break open machines and factories uh, and like turn them into things like cigarette lighters, smuggle them out to the to the countryside, and then barter them for some potatoes. Uh, but the idea here was that it would be directed by the state, uh, and that there would be uh, chits and, and like comp- sort of state script. And that that would make up for the shortfall directly instead of just giving more money to people at the top and hoping it would get down in people's hands through spending. Now, it was called crackpot by a lot of people, but a number of 
prominent economists endorsed it as essentially sound. Uh, but more importantly than anything, it was a huge challenge to capital in a way that not even the New Deal had been. This was, a, this was raising the stakes significantly at a time when the public was really desperate and willing to listen to a lot of ideas, no matter how seemingly off the, uh, off the beam they might have appeared even a few years ago, because people were suffering, California in particular. Because remember, California is the end of the frontier. The frontier is the is was always has was always America's exhaust, exhaust pipe, America's vent for overproduced social steam, and California hitting that shoreline really was the moment America became at some fundamental level aware of its own mortality, because free real estate is an underpinning ideology to all other American ideologies and the Pacific ocean is this huge black reminder that the end is coming. There's no more land after this. And so California then, especially in the thirties became this twilight land where you had, where literally dreams were made of in the form of the new Hollywood colony where, where, which was the headquarters for film production, uh, and also the detritus of the Depression and the Dust Bowl, coming the the people, the most desperate people coming to the plant land of where there was genuine plenty, uh, and good sunshine, uh, and finding not a happy answer, finding police cordons, uh, chain gangs, uh, brutalization, because. Uh, California is a, is a smiling face with a knife behind the back. Is, it is Nathaniel Hawthorne's Day of Locusts. So let's, that's the st- let's set the stage in California for the 1934 uh, upcoming uh, election uh, for governor. The incumbent is Frank Merriman, a absolute time-serving hack, a relatively befuddled old man. He had been elected lieutenant governor, the previous year, previous election, uh, and it had become governor when Sonny Jim Rolfe died. So he was an accidental man uh, who was really just a warm body in a chair who nobody really had any faith or investment in. Uh, and he was running uh, a competitive uh, primary. And, and the Democratic race for governor was hugely varied. Meanwhile, in the run-up to 34, uh, Upton Sinclair's book catches on like wildfire. It inspires the creation of hundreds of epic clubs uh, around the state of California where people from all walks of life, but honestly, mostly from the most desperate straits, come to, came together uh, to work towards the goals that Sinclair laid out in the book. Uh, and there was a funnily on, an entrepreneurial element of the whole thing that kept it going. Uh, because it was such a lit- it was such a uh, literarily talented movement. I mean, Sinclair was that was the he wasn't a great novelist by any means, but he was a compelling prose stylist, uh, and he had others in his orbit who were also literarily uh, talented. So they were able to make their own newspaper, the Epic News, which uh, volunteers could buy from the cam- from the uh, Epic organization, which was like a uh, uh, which is a not, it wasn't a party. It was a, I guess you would call it an NGO. It was sort of the DSA of its time, honestly. That's the closest thing I can think of as a comparable organization. And you could buy copies of Epic uh, Times and then sell them on the street for, uh, and keep the profit. Uh, and it was actually a very successful system that made the organization relatively uh, solvent and that gave chances to make money to very desperate people. Uh, the, the main base of support for Epic was in Southern California, which is the, where the majority of transients coming from other states ended up uh, because of the weather and the uh, opportunities in agricultural labor. And also, let's not lie about it, the lure of Tinseltown. So some friends of uh, Upton one day say to him, why don't you run for governor as a Democrat now? And Upton thought it up and said, sure, I will. And the epic movement became the basis for the Sinclair for governor campaign. Uh, And 
he entered a very crowded Democratic primary. There were seven, there were six other candidates, the most prominent of whom was a ex journalist named George Creel, who had managed Woodrow Wilson's propaganda um, uh, office during World War I. He was the guy who manufactured all that consent from a nation that basically didn't want to go and fight in that war for no reason. And Sinclair entered the race, and his epic army went to work. They sold uh, copies of the Times. They, create, they did correspondence groups. They uh, bought airtime. They handed out flyers. And when the, and the media, of course, mostly entirely strategized around avoiding the hell out of even talking about Upton Sinclair, this wacky socialist who'd written a million screwball books about Bolshevism and yeah, also about, you know, uh, vegetable enemas and, and spirit telepathy. This guy's a kook. This is not a real campaign. There wasn't really even any polling because nobody thought it was worthwhile. And then the primary happened. Upton Sinclair got over 400,000 votes, which is more than 51%. He, uh, he, he beat his nearest opponent by over 100,000 votes. Uh, and it was an absolute shockwave when it happened because this was just not inside the, the realm of possibility for the people who ran California. And let's go over who they were for a minute. So the kingpins of California were, first and foremost, the uh, agricultural timber and media barons who... Uh, had who were generally like the second or third generation of the uh, original Western uh, 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 robber barons, like for example George Randolph Hearst, or I'm sorry, William Randolph Hearst, the son of gold mining newspaper man and Deadwood antagonist George Hearst, um, McClatchy, who owned the McClatchy newspapers, the the large bankers, mostly out of San Francisco, which was the first real uh, 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 center of capital concentration in. California long before LA capital was most concentrated in Northern California. That's where the people rushed in for the gold and rushed back out and left some. Uh, and that became the basis for timber magazine, newspaper, uh, and, uh, banking fortunes like the McClatchy's and William Randolph Hearst. Now down South, there was fewer concentrations of power. The big one was Harry Chandler, the owner of, of the hyper reactionary owner of the, of the LA times. And, of course, there were the studio heads, Louis B. Mayer, the Warner Brothers, Irving Thalberg. These were the guys who ran Hollywood and were all, almost to a man, hyper-reactionaries. They were all street kids from New York, mostly, who had made it to the top of the ladder and then decided to kick the fuck out of it so no one else could get up after them. And they hated socialism as you could imagine so the so those are the people who would be arrayed against st Clair. the people who would be arrayed on his side are a collection of perfectionist eccentrics and cranks uh and of course the, the people who provided the creative spark of hollywood the show folk as it were and then of course the 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 armies of the damned the people who had fallen through the cracks when the depression happened and never been able to get back out the people who had traveled uh, the rails to the, to be there, and of course, uh, Mexican and uh, black and uh, Southern Californians who were uh, rigidly segregated uh, and and hyper exploited. That's your cross section of California, uh, and the immediate political context of the primary was before Upton Sinclair shocked the world by winning that uh, winning that nomination. The big story in California had been the general strike in San Francisco that summer, uh, where striking longshoremen had initiated a, a, a general strike that included over 150,000 workers uh, and lasted four days before Frank Merriman intervened with the National Guard. There are some rumors uh, and suggestions that Merriman's uh, spot on the top of the Republican ticket, which had been in danger. He, he was in danger of losing the support of some of his, the big Republican uh, donors was secured by his decision to crack heads on behalf of capital there. So everyone is caught flat footed by Sinclair's victory. Uh, and they sure as hell were not 
secured in their worries uh, when he gave his victory speech, which included the lines, we confront today the collapse of an institution which is worldwide and age old. Capitalism has served its time and is passing from the earth. A new system must be found to take its place, and that event is the same thing to our society as childbirth is to the individual. The child may be born, but both the child and mother may perish in agony. So yeah, uh, that's not the kind of thing you want to hear if you're Louis B. Mayer or William Randolph Hearst. And so as soon as Sinclair got the nomination, and by such a big margin, and with Epic in the street, the immediate momentary mo- uh, belief everywhere was that he was going to win. Everyone was convinced he was going to win from the top of the, uh, the ruling class of California to the White House. His victory was a foregone conclusion because of the size of his mandate and the size of his popular army and because of the genuine um, economic crisis in California and the Republican Party's failure to rise to the challenge of it. So everyone went into panic mode. Um, all of the genuine, generally bickering and at cross purposes uh, moguls and power brokers of California who were at, were at each other's necks until the moment before the primary all became simultaneously allied. Democrats, Republicans, uh, whether it was the leaders of MGM and Warner who had just been fighting over who would land Claudette Colbert for their latest picture, they were all on the same side. All the, all the newspaper magnates, all the uh, agricultural uh, monopolists who were fighting each other for preference in uh, in subsidies, all of them on the same side. And the money flowed to a huge network of front groups, some of them fronted by Republicans, some of them fronted by, by Democrats, all of them reputed to be collections of concerned citizens who want to defend America against the, the monstrous, tyrannical threat of Bolshevism in the form of Upton Sinclair. There was a progressive candidate in the race At this point, the Progressive Party still had some significant uh, electoral juice. The La Follets in in Wisconsin had a political machine uh, uh, and basically owned owned all of the statewide offices in Wisconsin. Uh, Them and their Progressive Party owned all the statewide offices in Wisconsin. Uh, There were progressive governors across the country. In fact, California had a former governor uh, Hiram Johnson was the other was a senator from California, so the party still had significant base in the middle class, basically in California, and it was represented by an uh, up and coming young lawyer named Ray Haight, H A I G H T. As you can understand, that name carries some weight in Northern California. He was an idealistic young lawyer who genuinely thought that uh, he was fighting for a sensible synthesis of. Um, of Merriman's stand padism, as they used to call it, being conservative uh, in the newspapers, and uh, Sinclair's radical experimental utopianism. The socialists and the communist parties both ran, ran candidates, and the people within the parties, to varying degrees, either hated Sinclair with a fury uh, or defected to his campaign and voted for him. The first big event of Sinclair's campaign once the primary ended was a cross-country train ride to New York to meet FDR at Hyde Park during his vacation. And Sinclair spent the entire ride across the country when he wasn't doing publicity preparing for this meeting. He was essentially going to try to get FDR to endorse it because at that point, FDR and the New Deal were riding high because, as I said, they were seen as active. They were seen as actually working on the problem of the Great Depression. Republicans just did not have a solution. They were complaining about the New Deal, but without any substantial counteroffer. They had nowhere to go because they were now fixed as the conservative party. And so they could just kind of twiddle their thumbs, and most people didn't respect that. They wanted action. And so if FDR sanctified Sinclair, it would take that taint of radical... uh, radicalism away from him and away from the ideas of production for use but at the same time it would threaten capital in a ways that a president uh is sensitive to you uh, know that maybe upton sinclair wouldn't have been but the meeting was necessary it was the that was, his his nomination was the political story of the midterm 
So Sinclair met Roosevelt at Hyde Park, and as happened with basically everybody who ever met Roosevelt, he thought he had secured an amazing uh, agreement. He basically, what, what it seems as though happened, there's no recording of the conversation, is that he essentially pitched FDR on production for use, and FDR got so carried away with it, he, he got so excited about the possibilities of it, he was able to picture it, that he sort of implied in some way or another to Sinclair, at least to the degree that he believed it, that he was going to go on the radio and tell people, if not to vote for Sinclair, that production for use was going to be part of the New Deal in some way. And it already was. There were already, there were some, there was federal money being given to local cooperatives to see if they could be scaled up. Uh, but it was, it was all very piecemeal and, and low, small bore. Uh, and this idea of just scaling it up to the size of a huge state like California it appealed to the romantic in FDR. Uh, but the thing about FDR is, is that he was very loose with his promises. And a guy like Sinclair has a hard time dealing with people like that because a guy like Sinclair has never been, has never lied to any human. Uh, and because he would consider it a sin and it has a hard time for him to imagine others being uh, untruthful to him. So when Sinclair came back to California, he was basically sure he had the election in the bag because he thought FDR was going to endorse him. And his powerful political uh, uh, patronage boss, James Farley, was in that camp because while Farley was like a Democratic partisan and didn't really care about ideology, he cared about advancing the interests of the Democratic Party and himself within it, uh, that meant that forget what F what Epic means, it also is a Democrat in uh, the... California governor's mansion, which hadn't happened for 30 years. Uh, California had been a relatively solid Republican or progressive state uh, up until that point. So this is a chance to break uh, the political hegemony in California and, you know, realign it towards the Democrats. Who cares what he says about production? Production for you, schmuck, for schmooze. That's what he would say. And so in those early days, there was a real feeling in the White House that they communicated to Sinclair that they were going to endorse him, or at least uh, his plan, which would have secured it, no question. Uh, but in the next couple of days, the tide started turning immediately because the full force of money went at work, and the people opposed to Sinclair essentially created the modern political uh, campaign out of scratch, almost. That is how desperate they were those last two months, how flat-footed they were. They dumped all the money in the world into California, and enough of it got thrown in there that they were able to cobble together a machine of propaganda unseen in political uh, campaigning until that point, anywhere close. Uh, the, the Hollywood studios, which had a specific uh, gripe with Sinclair because uh, not only did he uh, promise to tax the hell out of the moguls, he also wanted to open a rival state-owned movie studio that would produce films co cooperatively like uh, presumably in exchange for barter uh, that would compete with Hollywood offerings and uh, and be shown in state-owned theaters because at this point most uh, theaters were owned by uh, movie studios I mean he was literally threatening directly to put them out of business like a public option for entertainment a real one uh, so the studio just reacted ferociously most publicly, the uh, bigwigs made loud threats about moving the movie studios either back to New York where they'd fled from or more realistically, Florida. And a couple of movie bigwigs actually went to Florida to scout where they would put uh, Hollywood East. But the thing is, most people who were close, the closer you were to the business, the more you knew they were lying and that it was way too much of a hassle to pick up and move. They would just take the haircut because of the massive uh, pr uh, potential opportunity cost of that kind of physical plant relocation. So they're mostly full of shit, but they said it in the, in the print and it was printed faithfully. Uh, but they also had things like the Merriman tax at every studio. One day's pay out of every paycheck was automatically donated to the Frank Merriman campaign. And if you complained about it, you got the boot. The only people who were able to stand up against it were like Jimmy Cagney, but they also, the studios also produced phony newsreels. They created a series of newsreels called uh, Investigative Eye, 
where a sort of an Errol Morris interrogator uh, would talk to Sinclair, Merriman, and Hate supporters at seeming random, but just so for some somehow all of, and they would say relatively anodyne things. Like they'd say, I'm for Sinclair because he's for working people, or I'm for Merriman because he's solid. What really mattered is that the Merriman supporters were all solid middle class burgers. The Sinclair supporters were scruffy, unkempt, some of them foreign, uh, or disheveled or minorities. It gave the impression of this is who the coalition is. This is who would win if this candidate won. And they were presented as real news. Uh, and they got more brazen as the campaign went on. At one point, they took footage from, of hobos jumping off a boxcar from a film uh, and put it in a newsreel claiming it's, it was the result of the, the, the hordes of immigrants storming into California on the promise of a handout that they would get from Epic. Now, Sinclair didn't really help his case when it came to the propaganda that was going to be hurled against him because as soon as he got back from California, he made a huge campaign-defining gaffe uh, at a press conference. They asked him, how is FDR going to, how is he going to ensure that the White House and the federal government would cooperate with the sweeping reforms that he was talking about? I mean, in certain ways, California would have to be taken out of the monetary system to, to replace so much of its cash inputs with, like, command economy. And he said puckishly and sort of ironically, well, you know, I told Harold X, who was one of the inner circle members of the campaign, of the New Deal, that half the country is going to move to California, so they better help me out. Uh, and at the time, the, uh, nobody really took anything of it, but one of the more cynical reporters put it out there as as Sinclair essentially promising that there would be a hobo army marching on Washington, uh, mar marching on California, and so the press ran with it, and there were posters of hobos, uh, billboards of hobos coming to get you, railroad newspaper, uh, radio stories about incoming hordes of hobos coming to get you. They're gonna they're gonna steal the pies off your windowsill and sensuously wiggle their fingerless gloved hands over it, and there was no counter argument because the newspapers were entirely owned by a large capital and were entirely against to us existential level Sinclair. So there was nothing even approaching fairness in any level of media, the times, the San Francisco Chronicle, all the August gray ladies that we all know think of as founts of, uh, of, of settled knowledge. were all out yellow journalist style, like shit out of James calendar writing for the Jefferson campaign pure propaganda against Sinclair. There was nothing about Merriman because Merriman was an absolute uh, cipher and a empty suit. And he even probably knew it to an extent. Although at one point he did complain that all that money was going out to demonize Sinclair and nobody said anything about him, but all of it was negative. It was, it was mostly about taken out of context quotes from his books because he had written radical literature. He had criticized all religious traditions. He criticized all professions and all all betrayals of humanity before the almighty dollar and so that meant there were a lot of quotes a lot of them just lines of dialogue from characters that weren't even supposed to be the the author's actual beliefs in novels that were splashed on the front page of newspapers every day leading up to the end of the campaign it was an absolute for and and a lot of this money was being a lot of these messaging was being organized by the very first super PACs uh, local California uh, operators, uh, specifically a guy named Artie Seamus, I'm sorry, specifically a guy named Artie Samish, uh, who was the king of uh, Sacramento lobbyists, brought all of that money together and turned it into a full service campaign shop for messaging, purchasing of uh, airtime and news and news ads, uh, placement of stuff, production of Direct mail material, this is also one of the first campaigns to feature massive direct mail to people. Most of it about how Sinclair was going to send a stew bum, a stew bum to collect and buy your icebox. Everyone was together, you know, uh, from Pope to Prime Minister, uh, uh, Guzot to Metternich. They were all allied against Sinclair in public. And there was obviously a huge backlash from the giant number of people who were in favor of Sinclair and were vehemently in favor of Epic. 
And they complained and they pointed it out and they wrote their own letters to the editor and they made their own stink about how the media was biased. But it was just peppering the margins of this hegemonic argument that said to people, this man is a communist. Uh, this man wants to destroy freedom and, and happiness in your lifetime. And then if you didn't buy that level of the propaganda uh, um, claim, then there was the claim of authority that was behind it, after, uh, behind the claim of persuasion, which was, okay, fine. It's, it would be good. He would be better than this, this no idea fucking uh, uh, placeholder, this canned ham in a suit. But guess what? We're not going to let him do anything. We're not going to let anything happen. It's all going to be a failure and a disappointment, so why not just give up now? Uh, and pretty, sure, pretty soon that combination of messages started to work. And Sinclair went on his back foot. And then when that happened, all of a sudden the White House got cold feet about endorsing Sinclair and, start, and stopped sending any messages that they were uh, positive to him. They just started saying, we do not comment on state races, and they just cut him off. And at one point, Farley himself had to uh, uh, deny that he had sent a letter to a constituent in California saying that they endorsed Sinclair that was sent out as like a test balloon in the first week. And then when it came back with that response, they said, no, I do not know this man. They did not, they did, they, uh, they denied him. One of the, uh, uh, so the press did things like, for one thing, they lied brazenly about things like the number of migrants who were arriving in California every day. They claimed that there was a huge spike after Sinclair's nomination that doesn't appear to have actually existed. They, uh, at one point, pointed out that Sinclair had three houses. That, that lasted for about a week of stories because he did, in fact, own a small hermit shed, uh, and then he had a modest book-lined home in Pasadena that doubled as his self-publishing company because he wrote so quickly and at such small regard for quality that not a lot of his books got published by reputable publishers. So he essentially sold them retail uh, by people who ordered them, uh, and he lost money on it every year. But his wife, uh, to get extra money because they were always pretty poor, uh, speculated in real estate with her own money. Uh, Sinclair, of course, would never have done that with his own. Uh, and she, was, she basically flipped houses. And at the time of the campaign, they owned and had access to a, a distressed mansion in Beverly Hills. So there was a week of stories that Sinclair had three houses. Uh, and so... The message came down so loud and clear from, from capital to uh, the, the media in the form of news and entertainment that everyone else got the message uh, and every system relied against uh, Sinclair. Like in, uh, on college campuses, the deans of UCLA and uh, University of California at Berkeley uh, refused to allow pro Sinclair speakers on campus and in fact suspended students who uh, objected to that uh, it, which led to a mini free speech on campus controversy where uh, protesters demanding that the students uh, at UC Berkeley be readmitted uh, who had been suspended for uh, demanding to have pro Sinclair speakers the speakers were heckled and booed by the fraternity and sorority sister for, uh, by the fraternity members and sorority sisters of the school, and uh, at one point they literally threw tomatoes at them. So if you ever watch an old movie and think, why are where, who brought tomatoes to a speech? They used to do that for real. There's newspaper reports. They tomatoed the uh, the students. Uh, yeah, that's right. The right wingers uh, they deplatformed uh, the Sinclairite communists with fucking tomatoes. And in the legal system, Republican lawyers began to challenge thousands and thousands and thousands of registrations claiming that people uh, did not have uh, did not live at the addresses that they had supplied but the law at the time was is that if you were a transient you could make you could receive mail and vote from an address that was not where you uh, were currently living as long as you made efforts to change the registration after securing permanent lodging within like a month or so so these people, a lot of them were transient, but would have a permanent address at a flop house or a SRO hotel that they didn't necessarily live at, but which they would vote there. Uh, and so those thousands of those sort of registrations were challenged and a secret list 
uh, was made and announced of indictments of people who were claim who the they who were claimed by Republican lawyers to have illegally registered. And if those people came to vote, they would be subpoenaed and indicted. Uh, and anyone and no one knew whose name would be on that list because it was secret. Now those the, that those attempts were challenged all the way through the court system uh, in the months leading up to, in the two months leading to the campaign. And it actually kind of backfired a little bit on the Republicans because the uh, attempt to uh, to expunge the to challenge registrations was thrown out in court, and the people who came to meet their indictments who had been indicted uh, were almost universally uh, given the given their uh, right to vote back without charge. Uh, and uh, by the by election day, the scheme had been suspended uh, with a lot of public reaction and uh, and. Dis- and disturbance at the really awful um, abuse of uh, the legal system on behalf of a political candidate. But after a month of this, after a month of this, everyone kind of agreed that uh, Sinclair's goose was cooked. Uh, there were just too many, too many quotes, too many out of context observations too many organizations out there saying how evil sinclair was saying that sinclair was a godless free-loving perverted quack a communist who was going to red fly the red flag over the capital and he was going to communicate communalize all property including your wife uh they would send uh the some of these front companies would send out circulars and they all had different names for epic epic stood for elect parties endorsing communism everyone pinched in california End pleasure in California. Endless publicity I crave. Empty promises in California. Endow poorhouses, injure colleges. That's the kind of shit he was putting up with. And people started to waver. First FDR and then pretty much everybody, including his own supporters. And about halfway through that campaign, people kind of gave up. And the real stake to the heart for everything was the release of the Literary Digest poll. Because uh, scientific polling was still very much in its infancy at this point. There were not a lot of polling uh, with any kind of um, predictive power. The one poll that people paid attention to in California was put out by this magazine called Literary Digest. They would send a ballot, a, a, a sample ballot, randomly to thousands of their subscribers in the state of California. And then over the weeks leading up to the campaign, people would fill it out and mail it back in. It was the only real poll. It was basically every Nate Silver poll aggregate popped into one. Uh, And people were very invested in it. And it came out about three weeks before the end of the campaign. And it had Sinclair down by a two to one margin. Just annihilated. And that started sort of a little backlash as the money led up. Because people were worried that if they pressed too hard, they would alienate everybody. They would, they would, the the display of power would become too vulgar, and that led to um, a push back to Sinclair. And the thing is, this whole time that his numbers are going down, and that people are coalescing around this received wisdom of him as an unelectable and ineffectual radical, he's having giant rallies all over the state, huge, tens of thousands of people. And those are people who were all dedicated to the campaign, and they were ready to fight for it. And towards the last week of the campaign, there was this like slight burbling of an anxiety that, oh my God, we, he might actually win this thing. And the thing, and it didn't help that that was the exact same time in the campaign when they finally had to wheel Merriman's old ass uh, out to be the alternative to the fanged communist monster. Sinclair and uh guess what he was not a very inspiring sight uh but he did at one point towards the end of the campaign essentially say that he would govern as a new dealer which is a direct result of the pressure from the left that he faced and everyone and every power in California faced from the Sinclair campaign so election day finally comes in November heavy turnout nice weather very tense atmosphere there are fights there are uh, riots, uh, mini riots uh, uh, at polling places across the state. Thousand, uh, uh, Republican p- attorneys fanned out to challenge thousands and thousands of uh, voters across the state, most of whom end up having to uh, 
and in provisional ballots. But as the results start coming in, it's clear that Sinclair is in a pretty deep hole. But over the course of the night, he starts getting better. And he starts getting better. He starts gaining and gaining and gaining. He's gaining. And not only is he gaining, and more importantly, honestly, than the fact that he's gaining, is that epic allied candidates, Democrats who would endorse the epic plan, are winning up and down the state for state assembly races, for U.S. Congress races, uh, and, and the movement is clearly working. And Sinclair, uh, I would like to thank Twitter user at uh, TribTowerViews for hipping me to some very interesting electoral map data from 1934 showing how voting for Sinclair directly, votes for Sinclair and Merriman directly overlay on neighborhoods in uh, Northern California and uh, in Northern California and, uh, and in LA where along red line districts and, and this is a campaign that didn't really have a specific pitch to African Americans, uh, red line districts and places of heavily concentrated industrial workers. So it was a true class war, uh, but in the more, more middle-class, uh, and, and as a result of that, uh, Sinclair won, uh, it won in L.A., which was the headquarter, which was the base of Epic, but he got he got pretty much annihilated in San Francisco and in the Bay Area, which was more middle class. Uh, and in the Central Valley, uh, interestingly enough, Ray Haight, the progressive, did well because the McClatchy uh, family that owned the Bees, Sacramento Bee, and the other Bees in the Central Valley towns uh, endorsed uh, the progressive, and he doubled his vote there. Uh, to, c- according to anywhere else, uh, which means that the last minute effort that FDR made to try to have Sinclair drop out and endorse hate uh, might have worked, but Sinclair was never going to bow out for somebody polling so far behind him. But hate was sure that he could have won by combining all, both of their powers, uh, even though, of course, he hadn't been the one to win a Democratic primary with huge, huge percentages of actual voters. Uh, by the way, after the campaign, a slightly embittered Ray Haight uh, speculated that the people who backed his campaign might not have actually been earnest progressives who wanted to see him take power, but actually were more interested in defeating Sinclair. Sinclair rose and fell over the course of the night, but at the end, he had fallen short, but not in the blowout a lot of people had been expecting even a few weeks ago. Uh, he won. He got he got over eight hundred and uh, eight hundred and seventy five thousand votes, uh, which was more than double what he had made, what he had voted, what he had gotten in the primary uh, to Frank Merriman's one point one uh, million votes, about a ten point loss, which was and and bear in mind, Democrats swept the rest of the state uh, as they did everywhere. Nineteen thirty four was a very anomalous year in that it is one of the very few uh, where a incumbent presidential party and congressional party gained seats uh, in all, all three houses at the national level and absolutely swept pretty much every state. I think there were only something like seven or eight Republican governors left in the country after the 1934 uh, election. And one of them was Frank Merriman because even though there were radicals who ran and won in 34, Floyd Olson, the farmer labor governor of Minnesota, who was hated by many of the same forces who hated Sinclair, was reelected, even in the face of the machinations of the ruling class there in Minnesota. Uh, And a candidate who ran on an end poverty in Washington plank won the Washington gubernatorial race. Uh, But Sinclair couldn't get over the hump because of the concentrated, brutal fire of the uh, collected organs of consent manufacturing in the state of California. The fact, the, the way that Merriman was able to win that election, considering how Republicans fared everywhere else and considering his record as governor, it, it really does tell you that any other Democrat would have won. Uh, by the way, Ray Haight won. Uh, Ray Haight got a little over 300,000 votes, uh, which is more than the gap between Sinclair and Merriman was, but not only did the majority of Ray Haight voters not have uh, Sinclair as their second choice? 
much more likely is the case that the majority push came to shove. These good, new, these good middle class liberals push come to shove. They're going to pick the verities of capitalism over the stormy, untested seas of socialism. So the New Deal era was an era of experimentation, as I said. Uh, bids and counter bids between labor and capital. And Epic and Upton Sinclair's campaign in 34 signaled the upper limit of what would be acceptable to be metabolized by the political system. And capital responded in kind by sending a message to everyone from FDR to a hobo popping out of a boxcar in La Jolla, California, that there's, there is a line that will not be crossed. And that line is challenging actual capitalist mode of production. We might be amenable to redistributing some um, lucre and lightening some conditions and allowing the workers some influence over their working conditions, but we will still manage the, ma we will manage the surplus of their labor. Th they that will not be the work of the state. That will, because that is a degree of power we are not willing to give up. And this election, this outpouring of money, this, this vulgar display of power by the, by the democratic or <clears throat> by, by capital is just a shadow of what would come if people didn't take the message and work down from there. And the degree of capital opposal, opposition to Sinclair was so well known that when Sinclair officially lost, his wife broke down in tears of relief. Uh, and one of the high-level campaign staffers went over to her and said, it's okay, none of us wanted him to win. Because he was a frail, old, Puritan uh, flake. He was, he, was, he was a pure soul. He was, he was the sort of guy, the sort of, uh, of, of, of ethereal prophet who would get ground into hamburger by the powers arrayed against him from Sacramento to San Francisco to Hollywood to, San, to D.C. They would have ground him up and spit him out. In fact, so much so that um, the, there's an anecdote that uh, Sinclair re, uh, released that, that Sinclair related in the book he wrote immediately after losing, which was called I Candidate for Governor and How I Got Licked, which blames the media, mostly the lie machine, as he called it during and after the campaign, uh, and points a lot of fingers, uh, mostly in the right direction, but is basically conciliatory towards FDR and says, if I'd done a better job, if I didn't have so much baggage, if I hadn't been so easily lampooned, if I didn't have such a hot, loud public figure, um, hey, they would have maybe felt more comfortable to back me. But that's one of those unsolvable contradictions. Like Sinclair was maybe the worst possible vehicle for that movement because of his history. But it was his history as an ascetic, compulsive do-gooder that gave him the moral buy-in with people to take Epic seriously in the first place. Uh, it, it really is sort of a Moses principle. The, the people who can make movements and make people feel, feel ideology to the level of emotion transfer uh, uh, the idea of solidarity into the feeling of love generally aren't the same people who should be in charge of political movements uh, and, in, and certainly not uh, have power in executive offices. So Sinc uh, Sinclair wrote this book uh, and in it, he, uh, he justifies sort of the loss and his decision never to pursue future office by the fact that a friend relayed to Sinclair the story that a businessman told him that before the election, he had written his will, purchased a gun, and was prepared to drive to Sinclair's victory speech and shoot him if he had won. Now, that might have been a story a guy told to flatter Sinclair uh, or scare him away from something he knew wasn't good for him, but either way, Sinclair took it as a sign. But anyway, that's the degree to which he would have been ground into, into powder uh, by the state. But here's the thing. Yes, he would have failed as governor. It's, it's, it's almost, there's no question. I mean, he, uh, one of his campaign managers who won state office uh, in the 34 campaign uh, beat Frank Merriman the next time to become governor uh, and had an ineffectual failed four-year term. Uh, Col Colbert Olson, his name was. But an even less grizzled politi politician like Sinclair would have been ground up. 
Epic wouldn't have worked in any broad sense. He would not have created some, uh, Epic would not have transcended capitalism. Uh, for the first, I mean, forgetting the fact that Sinclair himself was a uh, imperfect political operator to manage such a thing, it was a computational problem. Uh, it was the computational problem that, that, that doomed Soviet uh, agricultural collectivization and industrialization. It's the computational problem that vexed communist regimes all throughout their histories. And uh, it is how do you replace the price signal? Like a situation like the Great Depression calls for prices to be replaced by command economies, but how do you replace the price signal to maintain the efficiency of the exchanges? And there was not the computational ability to do so. But even if Epic had failed, it would have been better for the progress of the nation if he had won simply because the fact of its, its persistence in the face of that kind of organized opposition would have raised expectations. It would have changed the material conditions of people in California and the country. They would change their expectations relative to what is the possible in the world of politics, and that would have changed their orientation towards the, the issues of the politics of the day. Uh, it would have pushed the Democratic Party leftward, uh, most likely, uh, and it very well might have challenged the Democratic Party uh, at its base if it hadn't accommodated enough of its movement, uh, uh, depending on how successful it is. But I would argue that even an epic that fails is an epic that people remember from then point on and would have served as a, as a talisman, as, 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 as sort of a Camelot that could be returned to. Because while computational problems bedeviled socialism in the, in the 20th century, I, I got to believe that they have largely been conquered in the 21st. I mean, obviously, we need a lot of work to do in terms of directing our, uh, our brain power towards that question instead of the pauperizing question of maximizing profit over uh, levels of latency in the economy. And I mean, Chile, try, Ch Chile under Allende made a, made a good faith effort towards conquering the socialist uh, computation uh, <clears throat> computational problem and we're doing well when the military literally kicked the door down and machine gunned the computers a real real burning of uh the library of alexandria type moment in human history potentially <clears throat> but like so that question that question of computation should be on the agenda for any left movement that's trying to be ambitious uh and that question would be more prominent and would would have a more salient position in the material reality, the material contours of the world, if Epic had won, because it would have set us on a course where Epic was a possibility and would have accelerated us towards uh, achieving anything like a freedom that we think the world, that we all as humans deserve. Now, in that same way, through that same turning, christing of the cork, corkscrew, even though Epic was sold out by the New Deal uh, con artists, who merely wanted to rescue capitalism rather than destroy it or transcend it, their victory was another turn of the screw, previous, because Sinclair likely doesn't run as a Democrat and get, over a million, uh, get almost a million votes and create a network if he doesn't run as a Democrat. So the task of history is not assigning good or bad valence to, to decisions and actions. It's to decide whether or not they helped move us ever so so slowly in the right direction now epic itself uh you might ask what happened to that movement it was more than sinclair and it was it was it was hundreds it was tens of thousands of activists and uh organizers professional infrastructure of, of people in offices uh and a a directory which sinclair was still a member of in the immediate aftermath of uh Ep sinclair's loss epic was uh, subject to an internal witch hunt led by Sinclair himself, who was wildly phobic of communist influence. He hated the Soviet Union. He hated communism because of his humanism, because he saw, he saw repression and saw it did not please him. So he was very phobic of communists. And, and Epic pretty quickly dissolved from there, breaking up uh, uh, to avoid different takeover attempts by different factions within the internecine left. But Epic still helps start a process that is clearly in an early stage, obviously. But it is, an, it is an incipient act that at a certain point in history we will be able to look back on and see as the first or one of the first moments 
where the waves begin to reflect off one another and the system starts to gain instead of lose energy because we are not and that time might be coming sooner than we would ever think because we are right now in a crisis of demand on par with if not exceeding that of the great depression and the challenge of addressing basic human needs without the cannibalistic uh, demonic entity of the price signal is more pressing than ever and that makes concepts like epic even though they were kind of harebrained schemes of utopian dreamers who never really had a real job is still relevant and and something we can think of because as i said we have more computing power uh, we have computing power now that could be harnessed to social ends of the kind that is beyond the wildest dreams of a wild dreamer like upton sinclair and the question then is left to us now. What will we do with it?